Hello and welcome to the second episode of the Ancient World Magazine podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Browers, and I'm joined today by Matthew Lloyd, Rul Kanijnadag, Joshua Hall, and Owen Rees. The subject of today's talk will be the Ancient Greek Hoplite. But before we begin, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Joshua Hall. I primarily work on early Rome and Etruria. I'm mainly interested in warfare as a social phenomenon and how it played into the construction of social power or was used in the construction of social power in early Italian societies. Um, but on a more superficial level, I'm also interested in things like tactics, strategy, and the transmission of those across the Mediterranean, especially in Sicily and Central Italy. I'm Matthew Lloyd. I, uh, my research area is Early Iron Age Greece. My interest in warfare largely comes through uh, starting in the Archaic period and looking at this um, emergence of hoplite warfare that will complicate later and then just getting back into the Iron Age and seeing what do we actually know about this period between the collapse of the Mycenaean palaces and the rise of the polis, and you won't be able to see me doing the air quotes because it's not a visual podcast, but looking at warrior burials, iconography, and how warfare plays a part in society, very little on tactics and actual battle because it's archaeology, we don't get a lot of that. I'm Owen Rees, I am an associate lecturer of ancient history at Manchester Metropolitan University. My area of specialism is um, classical Greece, specifically classical Athens. Military history is the basis of most of my work, uh, with a fundamental interest in how warfare and society mix, and uh, quite often the tensions that res reside between the two areas. Uh, hello, my name is Rukh Nanendag. I am a, <coughs> a <coughs> teaching fellow in Greek history at the University of Warwick. I um, primarily work on classical Greek warfare and specifically my focus is on tactics, tactical developments, tactical thought, um, and also on the historiography of warfare. No, no book? <laughs> do, do you want me to pitch my book? I can do that. I recently, <laughs> recently published a book on Greek tactics which is called Classical Greek Tactics, A Cultural History, and it's out with Brill. And my name is Joshua Browers. I'm a Mediterranean archaeologist by training and I did a PhD on Greek warfare from the fall of the Mycenaean palaces to the end of the Persian wars. So the, um, the, the subject for tonight or for the, uh, this afternoon whatever is uh, hoplites. Does somebody want to start us off with a, a definition of what a, what a hoplite is so that we can then kill it and move on? <laughs> well, <laughs> well I was going to leap in with a thought about uh, how Hoplite is one of those words where, in modern scholarship, we use the ancient word to describe something that is really a modern concept. Uh, and so you get this with hoplite, you get it with polis, and we say hoplite, and we can mean either what we mean by hoplite or how hoplite was used in the ancient world. And we're supposed to take the former one first, what we really mean is heavily armed infantrymen, someone with the double grip shield, the spear, and at various points helmet, body armor, additional armor. Um, someone else can do phalanx if they like. <laughs> I, w I was just going to add that uh, the modern usage is the one that we see actually more often when we talk about um, the historical cultures of the central Mediterranean. So amongst the modern literature on the Western Greeks, for example, or Romans and Etruscans, you usually see hoplite paired with the word class, which is, of course, very problematic and is used by scholars because we don't have necessarily firsthand uh, nomenclature for the groups they're trying to describe. Yeah, so there's two sides to this. I mean, there's on the one hand the purely material, where we identify a particular kind of warrior with a particular set of equipment as a hoplite. But then we also have this very strong sense of that we associate this with a particular socio-economic group. And that's where things already start to get more complicated. Yeah, and, and needlessly complicated as well, because it, it 
engenders these these discussions where uh, everything hinges basically on how people define particular uh, terms. Like with the hoplite class, there's a particular uh, group of scholars who have a fairly good idea of what they mean when they refer to a hoplite class, but it's something that always needs to be defined and redefined. And the more they use it, the less it seems to correspond with the actual situation uh, that existed in the past when they didn't use uh, such terms at all. Yeah, because this is probably the right moment to point out that, you know, we, when we identify uh, an ancient warrior with this term of life, we usually refer to, as Matt said, to this warrior with the double grip shield and often with other accoutrements that we associate with the hop like heavy body armor, Corinthian helmets and stuff like that. Um, and we see those items appearing for the first time um, iconographically in sort of the, the late 8th century, early early 7th century. Um, but the term hoplite doesn't actually occur in Greek literature until the 5th century. So there's like a two centuries between the emergence of this kind of armor and the emergence of this concept that then starts to define how Greeks regard themselves when they when they go to war. Yeah, and there's the, the other problem of, like you said, you have the, the pictures on the one hand, so you have the iconographic evidence from the late 8th century, you have the archaeological evidence, and then you have the texts in the archaic period, so let's say the 7th and 6th centuries BC, where you have Tertius referring to uh, panoploi, for example, which means fully armoured men, uh, where the assumption is, on the part of most commentators, is that when he says uh, refers to a guy as a panoplos, he means a hoplite, clearly. Uh, whereas, you know, that might actually be a subject of some discussion. Well, presumably the two terms sort of translate similarly, because you think hoplite coming from uh, the Greek to hopla, literally the equipment. Um, I would assume panoploi would be a similar etymological link. I mean, there is a, at least a linguistic reason to think there might be some form of continuity, but they're not. I would add to that and say when we say hoplite first appears in Greek literature in the 5th century, what we have to qualify that with, as you discussed in the previous podcast a little, is that the first surviving reference to hoplite is 5th century. So we don't know that the word only really comes into use around the Persian Wars with Aeschylus and with Aeschylus. It's just that um, that's the first time we know of it being used. And we don't know of it being used in the 6th century, and we have evidence from the 6th and 7th century that doesn't use it. So that's a reasonable argument to say something is changing in how they're thinking about... Yeah, I mean, I would highlight that, the fact that they do use terms for heavy infantry or for heavily armed warriors, but it's not hoplite. So as you said, panoploi, but also more... Um, uh, more descriptive terms like Eichmetai or Doruforoi, which basically just means spearman. So there are terms in existence that express this concept, but they are not the word hoplite, which we project back into uh, into the archaic period. Yeah, with with the projecting back into the archaic period with hoplites com- also comes all the other baggage that was briefly referenced already with the, the social change and whatever, the whole idea that there was this hoplite class that emerged round about the same time as the, the equipment shows up in the archaeological and iconographic evidence where they say, oh, this is a, a new type of warrior. Uh, and because it's come to dominate modern discussions, the idea is that it was also somehow significant back in ancient times and was associated with social uh, socio-political uh, and cultural changes, uh, most notably the rise of a supposed middle class and the overthrow of the rule of kings and aristocracies. If we're moving into sort of the historical baggage, I suppose as like the early Iron Ageist, I should uh, say something a little about this early period, where what we get in the 8th and 7th century is new kinds of evidence. So starting from around 800, Athenians especially, but Greeks in general, start painting scenes of battle and people in armour with weapons on their pottery. And then in the 7th century you have this double grip shield appearing, um, not only on pottery but also in finds from Olympia, because also in the late 8th century you start getting um, dedications of weapons and armour in sanctuaries. So, and then on top of that you have the Homeric epics, which deal with warfare in 
uh, various degrees, the Iliad obviously very closely, the Odyssey less so, but it does still end with a big battle, um, which we traditionally date to around 700. Um, and then in the 7th century, Tertius, as you've already mentioned, um, Archilochus, who also writes about warfare, and you know lots of fragments of poetry from the 7th century that deal with warfare. So because what we see in the 8th century looks different to what we see in the 7th century, here we sort of postulate a difference, um, a change. But if you look before the 8th century, what we have are burials with weapons and not much else. So we don't really know how much is changing and what's changing. But I suppose that's getting to challenging the established position without really describing what it is first. So, I mean, the, the common narrative of the development of Greek warfare is that, um, I mean, I guess it doesn't really extend very far back into the Dark Age. It doesn't really say what warfare was like before, but it postulates something that's sometimes referred to as an 8th century revolution, which coincides with the rise of the hoplite, but also with the rise of the polis, with the rise of the reintroduction of literature, with the rise of new art forms, changes in burial practices, etc. Um, and generally is considered to be this era of an explosion of the sophistication of Greek culture. And it tries to tie all these things together. And the role of the hoplite in that story, according to this traditional narrative, is that he, like the introduction of this new kind of armor, um, requires the adoption of more large-scale um, collective warfare, which then encourages the um, sort of nascent concept of a political community, of a class of citizens who can afford this armor, um, and that it is their appearance as a political class, as a socio-economic class with newfound military and therefore political power, um, that sort of generates the development of Greek culture into sort of the, the heights of classical Greek civilization. Yes, and to that it's worth adding part of the argument here is that that double grip shield um, can only be used in a certain tactical formation, which is the close-knit phalanx where one man is protected by his neighbor's shield, partially protected by his neighbor's shield, which encourages solidarity within the ranks because you have to stand close together, you're relying on one another for protection. So the linchpin of this argument is you can only use this equipment in a certain kind of tactical formation, and that tactical formation promotes this kind of solidarity amongst the hoplite class. Yeah, which, as with the use of the term hoplite, is largely teleological because the, the hoplite phalanx as such as a single phrase isn't encountered in uh, the historical texts until uh, Xenophon, I think? Yeah, Xenophon, so 4th century sources. And it seems to a large extent like he created that as a technical term. I mean, it occurs in Homer, but not in the sense of a phalanx is a battle line of hoplites. It occurs in Homer more as a sort of generic description of different units within the battle and sort of groups of people. Um, so Xenophon seems to create more or less wholesale this concept of the phalanx in order to describe a particular formation. Um, and that doesn't occur until, obviously, when he's writing through the middle of the 4th century. It's interesting, though, that there, um, there was, after Xenophon, possibly an adoption of the, the idea of hoplite and phalanx together, um, reflected in my mind best, actually, in the uh, fragment we call the Inadetum Vaticanum, uh, the fragment of a, an unknown uh, Roman historian writing in Greek when he um, discussing a poss supposed revolution in uh, Roman tactics in the con uh, context of the Punic Wars um, says that uh, the Romans learned from the Etruscans to fight uh, with calcaspides with bronze shields in phalaxes in phalaxes. I was going to add in there about Homer, when um, Homer uses the word phalanx, it is in every case apart from one in the plural as well. It's um, phalanges, it's uh, multiple ranks, it doesn't imply this one unit, because uh, there is a line of argument that says 
Homer already describes the hoplite phalanx, which um, was briefly popular. I don't think it is anymore, but um, a central part of that argument is that Homer uses phalanx, but he doesn't use his phalanxes for the most part, um, which I thought was worth adding. Well, it's also worth adding, you've got um, more indirect evidence for the phalanx as a close-knit group, which is the, um, the Athenian sources especially obsess over it, is the idea of um, eutaxia, so good order, um, which obviously is conducive to a solid line, and the idea of being afraid of uh, eutaxia, so disorder in the lines, would give um, at least indirect support to this idea of a solid group in file, afraid of a looser formation, shall we say, afraid of um, a lack of order. So when you're referring to that, you're talking about 5th century sources at the earliest, aren't you? Or is there earlier evidence oh, of... Oh, no, you are right, yeah, it's, it's, it's the 5th century. For, uh, so I was, I was actually going to ask, the later, uh, the earlier historians among you, is anything like that in Homer? Does Homer talk about anything, well, the Homeric cycle, does it really refer to any concerns of the actual battle lines? Well, there is a reference when he describes the, the Greeks... Uh, going towards the, the battlefield. He describes them as uh, moving quietly and uh, in, a, in a more orderly fashion than the Trojans who are uh, described as just this cacophonous horde that spills out onto the battlefield. So there is sort of the idea of the, the Greeks being slightly more ordered than the Trojans, but there's nothing in the way to suggest uh, the use of, of very strict uh, formations. There's one passage in which in which Nestor gives some advice about how to arrange men and chariots and whatever, but it's it's uh, anomalous within the Iliad, and it's not exactly clear how strict that formation is supposed to be interpreted. So, no, there's there's nothing like that, like what like the clearer evidence for for tight formations, which you can see. Well, in the, the interesting thing about that passage where he says, oh, the Greeks are advancing quietly and, and in, in some kind of order, is that later on, the Greeks that are supposed to, you know, obsess over good order don't actually do that. And so Xenophon, when he's describing the Battle of Cunaxa, which he was at, um, he describes with some level of awe how the Persians, and specifically the Egyptians who are deployed over against him, are advancing in good order and quietly, like without shouting, um, which is clearly something that he's not used to, um, uh, because the men in his own formation, when they're given the order, they will scream and sing and charge, and so they will lose whatever order they have. So they're not commonly used to this idea of advancing quietly, and so whatever it is that they do in Homer um, <clears throat> must either be poetic license or a really quite exceptional situation. Uh, when we talk about formation, and formation being important and good order, uh, the evidence we have for the 8th and 7th century around this uh, putative revolution um, is that the Athenian or uh, geometric pottery usually shows single fighters in pairs fighting against one another, and very rarely shows uh, massed ranks of um, warriors, let's say, um, stood next to one another. And there are a few examples. So um, from the Parian Polyandrion, we have uh, two ranks of hoplites with, sorry, I've called them hoplites now, two ranks of warriors with round shields, um, some of whom carry spears, fighting over uh, a dead body. and these are sort of lined up warriors facing one another. Uh, the interesting thing about that vase being that at the very front, the first people on either line are archers. They have this big round shield, but they're also carrying a bow and firing that. So presumably this big round shield is not using one of their arms in such a way that means they can't fire a bow. Then in the 7th century, this depiction of warriors in a line becomes more common, um, but is still fairly rare. So arguments will always come around to the Kichi vase, and its importance in showing the phalanx, supposedly, 
but one of the reasons why they always come around to the Kichi vase is that if you look for another example, there isn't one. You can't find another depiction of a similar tactical formation that isn't reconstructed on the basis of the Kichi vase or um, later. So the problem here really is the question of what relationship does our evidence have to the reality of combat? Is it that um, these depictions are of uh, what is actually going on, that normally you will have one warrior against another um, fighting each other in combat, or is it just that that's the easiest way to show it, partially based on this epic cycle where we normally hear about individuals against individuals, rather than um, massed ranks, or is that the reality? Just want to jump in, there's another possible addition you could put to that, which is you've got the, the two options you've got. The third one is actually context of the pot. Hmm. Uh, let, let's say, it is, I, don't, I don't know all the specifics, and please feel free to jump in with one, but let's say it's a domestic pot. Do people really want uh, realistic warfare depicted on something they'll see regularly, or do they want the heroized notion of combat that actually doesn't need to portray reality at all? Yeah, you can you can also add another one, which is the the size of the pot, because a lot of the if you look at the seventh century, a lot of the Corinthian pottery is tiny, uh, so you could only fit uh, uh, you know these these sort of stylized one v one duels on them. Uh, whereas the Kichi vase, which has been mentioned already, that's that's uh, anomalous in more ways than one. Not in the least that it's also a fairly big vase for uh, uh, Corinthian standards, where you have multiple scenes uh, that may or may not all tie together, depending on how you interpret it. Um, but yeah, so so there there are all these these problems associated with how to interpret this particular evidence and. Um, one way to sort of solve that is to sort of sidestep it. Uh, no, but if you if you because if you just if you just look at the evidence and try to because one interpretation is essentially just as good as any other, basically uh, without any outside uh, sources or references. So if you look, somebody who uh, deliberately wants to interpret the Kichi vase as depicting the phalanx and thereby supporting his idea that the phalanx already the hoplite phalanx already exists in the seventh century BC, uh, is gonna say that all those scenes where you see uh, individuals fighting each other that's just uh, heroizing you know that's yeah inspired by mythology whereas the kichivas is like a, a photograph so you have you have all these arguments going around in circles and one of the things you can do to sort of sidestep that is like what salmon did in an article once and say why don't we just see for example can we guess just you know population sizes and army sizes based on different sources how many people would have been armed what would be logical to sort of you know try to take it out of the the the, the circular argument we just reinterpret the same evidence over and over and try to add some more information about that. And his argument was, for example, that in the archaic period, armies were much smaller than in the classical period. And so it stands to reason that perhaps they were organized more on a uh, personal relationship where you have a leader and his followers, sort of like what you see in Homer, uh, and not these these bigger armies, uh, more centrally organized, like what you see in the classical city-states, which could field thousands of warriors that would best be deployed in, in battle formation or whatever. So... I think in dealing with the uh, the Kiji vase, it's also important to remember the other things that have been attributed to the Kiji painter, like the um, I think we call it the Macmillan Arabalos, that you know itself also kind of does show more of a one versus one style of combat in the main um, in the main band, as far as um, artistic depiction goes. And also not taking the Kiji vase out of its fine context. I mean, it was found outside of ancient Bay. Was it painted specifically for an audience in, or for for a consumer in 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 Bay? I mean, is it is it portraying something current in you know Hellas in that period, or is it portraying contemporary Etruscan affairs? I mean, we have. Etruscan evidence from about the same period that shows lined infantry, but generally it's thought that these, well, 
I shouldn't say generally. Certain people think that these portray more of an armed dance or some type of civic function rather than necessarily any realistic depiction of battle or a battle line. And I think that's one thing that um, a, a lot of people that deal with the Kijibas, uh, from a, and Hellenic perspective leave out is the fact that it its context, its fine context, is not Greece. It is Etruria. And, you know, discussing it without that is very problematic to me. Yeah, that that's true for a lot of interpretations, especially with the artistic evidence. If a lot of the the vases that we have, uh, the the nice ones that are in museums that are intact or restored at least, uh, they all come from funerary contexts. So you can also, you know, it m- might have a very specific function, and the, the scenes depicted might have a very specific uh, interpretation to the ancient Greeks themselves. It is completely lost now, so. and that's uh, not helped by the fact that what gets um, into the big book publications are the nice complete vases that we know from funerary contexts rather than the nice fragmentary vases that um, we know from settlements. Um, so yeah, if you're not thinking about that fine context, you get a very different, um, or you miss part of the discussion. Something I wanted to throw out there, which is related to some of my research, is the other evidence we have, I was just checking the reference, um, is the lyric poetry. And in um, Archilochus Fragment 3, uh, on West's numeration, he talks about um, the Eubians being experts at uh, close combat with swords, um, and uh, there won't be many bows drawn nor much slingshot when on the plane the war god brings the fight together, etc. Um, which for me begs the question when we're talking about um, hoplites and connecting it to the polis, this argument points more towards uh, different places being known for different kinds of warfare. Um, so if you're positing a sweeping tactical change across Greece circa 700, is this possible in a more uh, fragmentary society or uh, where as the cultural differences are wider than they would later be so after this period of less intense uh, interaction that we call the dark age or early iron age can we think about how people will have fought differently and starting to use things in exactly the same way at exactly the same time is um, unlikely. Yeah, that, that's one of the main problems with the, uh, the the interpretations that we have. Again, there's reading back uh, onto ancient Greece, uh, sort of a, a modern perspective, that you sort of lose all the, 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 the differences between different regions that existed in Greece, even well into classical times, uh, when you look at, at Thessaly with its emphasis on cavalry, or Crete renowned for its archers, or Rhodes renowned for its slingers, and like you said, the, uh, the, the fragment by Archilogos where uh, there's reference made of the Euboians being great with swords and stuff. Um, yeah, that, all that that information basically gets swept under the under the rug because of the few um, sources of evidence we have that that is used for all this in, for all the interpretation it comes from a few very specific points uh, from a few very specific places like the Corinthian pottery and the Attic pottery and the uh, the, the lyric uh, poets and etc. So Herodotus from Athens and uh, and so forth. So you get a very distorted view. It's it's like basing your your history of uh, let's say uh, Britain on sources that come strictly from London 
So you know you're gonna you're gonna do say sweeping things about Britain based just on what you know from from material that you've recovered from London, which which will be very strange. And uh, it also sort of you know I mean uh, people in Scotland will be offended and, and so forth. So um, yeah, but that's that's basically what you do when, when you it sort of ties back with the previous podcast where we did where you have all these scraps of evidence and you try to create some sort of coherent story because as human beings you just want a coherent story for the most part and that's an urge that really you have to try and suppress I guess. Uh, that's, that's something that I, I I think I talk about a little bit too much regarding Sicily but I mean if we look at Theodorus and I mean this is evidence really only for the 5th century onward. He never uses the term hoplite. Well he uses it once to describe a, a western Greek or a really a Sicilian uh, Greek soldier. Every every other instance, um, he just uses very generic terms like stratiotai instead of hoplite, or hoplite, sorry. <clears throat> and I, I just find it very, very problematic and aggravating that people still push hoplite when talking about Sicilian warfare, even though our principal source for the region, Theodorus, who I mean, if if we want to be terrible and just call him a blatant copyist of um, earlier historians, then we really should respect the fact that he doesn't use the term hoplite in the West, except once. Sorry if that killed the conversation. I didn't mean it to. No, 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 not at all. But I mean, we've you've given uh, talks before, Josh, about how different differences in in warfare uh, between uh, Italy and, um, and and Greece, for example, among uh, Greeks in it, southern Italy and, and Greeks in in Greece themselves. And I think it's important to to realize all these differences that existed within even what we refer to now as the Greek world. Uh, that there was all this all this difference and all these. Uh, uh, all this variation, and it's the same applies also to the, to the classical period, of course. I mean, you already mentioned the fifth, the fifth century, but I think Owen and Rule will agree that also in the classical times, we're very much bound to the sources from a limited few places, and they give a, a view of warfare, especially uh, Athenian and Spartan, and not so much from other places. But maybe they can. I've, I've been chastised more than once for calling it Athena Spartac centric, which I stand by that term. <laughs> Perfect. I don't think you're wrong, Josh. <laughs> I will push for... Um, sorry. I'll throw in here about why this is why archaeology is important, because uh, obviously so many of our sport sources are Athenian, and Athenians uh, love to write about Sparta for some reason. Um, and more recent uh, scholarship, and when I say more recent, I mean the last two, three hundred years rather than very recent, has focused on Spartan society and Athenian society as these two extremely different things, whereas, as you discussed in the last podcast, um, archaeology still has its problems and its biases and who produces the material that survives. But you can get it from everywhere. You can get it from Thebes and um, I was tweeting about this earlier, so I'll mention it now. Like Thebes just has has a very recent uh, new museum that is huge and full of stuff from the Bronze Age to post classical that um, is from excavation. So we can know lots of things about Thebes. From the material evidence, um, and you know that's true of everywhere in Greece. We might not know about these places from written sources or know very little about them, but we can get evidence to give us a wider picture than the Athena of Sparta. Yeah, I kind of want to question that concept anyway, in the sense that I mean, when I set out to write this book, I was obviously wondered whether I should sort of be honest and say really when you want to write a social or a cultural history of warfare you have to focus on Athens simply because it's impossible to flesh it out to the same degree that you can for that context as I'm sure Owen will um, will attest but when it comes to tactical practice and tactical um, um, <coughs> habits and thinking um, 
the sources that we have, although the vast majority of them are come from Athens or are written by Athenians, um, often does reflect the practice of other Greeks as well. And it's difficult to say to what extent, of course, they are being sort of fit into an Athenian mindset or an Athenian paradigm. But broadly speaking, it is, I think, justified to speak of a Greek warfare, at least in the, for in the later classical period, that broadly answers to very similar practices and, and habits. Um, not in the sense that this has traditionally been done necessarily, but certainly in a sense that, you know, these Greeks sort of recognize and anticipate each other's responses to tactical situations. And it's not just Athenians and Spartans, but it is also Thebans and Argives and Corinthians and um, Thessalians and Olynthians and uh, Greeks in Western Greece as well. Yeah, and to, to add to that for Raw, it's, um you also get in the sources, um, they, they're quite interested in anomalies. So for, the, for them to be as interested in quite, what you might consider quite a small anomaly to a Greek norm uh, does suggest that there is this um, sort of standards the wrong word but uh sort of a almost a greek way of going about it i mean the, the classic is the fact that the thebans are said to line up deeper than everyone else which is uh on the surface quite a superficial thing but the, it, it does come up a few times and it's always commented on how weird it is um although i know rule has some very um interesting work on rank f numbers um the point being is always stated that the Thebans are always deeper. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. It's just that like a lot of those cases, it's not actually remarked upon how weird it is. And that's what strikes me when I, what, what struck me when I did my research is that a lot of the time it's not actually remarked upon how weird it is. Um, and a lot of it is actually taken completely in stride um, by a lot of these sources. I mean, what things that we have been taught to see as deviance and as, um, as, as, as exceptions actually, according to these authors, are perfectly acceptable without comment, without further elaboration of any kind. So yes, it is sometimes remarked that the Thebans are in deeper formation, but then also others also do this, and it is never regarded as something that is, um, you know, needs to be explained, something that is weird. I mean, if you're looking at things that need to be explained, Spartan habits frequently need explanation because they are simply um, they're more organized and they're more effective in, in battle than other Greeks. Um, that is something that the Greeks absolutely spend with lavish attention on um, to explain how that works. Um, <clears throat> if you're looking for things that they really like to explain in detail, it's things like light infantry tactics. They really love to describe in detail how light infantry can demolish hoplites. Um, it's not really in those things like, oh, the Thebans deploy deeper. That's not um, something that really gets remarked upon in any in any way and i like to stress especially when you're talking about phalanx depths is that um, when the thebans at the battle of Delion in 424 deploy a phalanx 25 deep that is actually the first time that we ever get a number of ranks in a historical source and it's 25 it's nothing else it's not eight it's not four it's not any kind of thinner than that that's the first one that we get at all and already at that point, it doesn't elucidate any remark from the cities. He just says they were 25 deep and the others were as deep as they wanted, which is literally the phrase he uses. So it's just like, it's completely up to them as far as he's concerned. Yeah, yeah, I see your point there, Rol. Um The only thing that sort of strikes me is it is described, um, I don't know if it's Adelium or the Nemea. Uh, so we're going to Xenophon now, but it's described as the, the Theban way. The Thebans do this. So they are almost defined by going deep. Uh, no, it's not. Not by the no. I mean, there's certainly it's certainly said that they deploy deeper than the others, but that's something that specifically the the allies at the Nemea had to make an agreement about the depth of the phalanx so that no one would do it. It's not specifically said so that the Thebans wouldn't do it. <laughs> it's a general thing that there is a tendency to go deeper because deeper means that you're more likely to win at that particular point of the line, although it endangers the rest of it. Can I throw out something of a clarification that uh, I don't want to deny, as it might seem I do sometimes, that there is um, a concept of Greek in the ancient world and that there might be a perceived Greek way of doing things. I think that when you get as far back as so at the 8th, 7th centuries, you have to be uh, more careful about um, deciding what is Greek, 
um, or what is uh, Greek in general rather than specific to Athens, Corinth, Euboea, um, etc. But that later on, um, when you have more written evidence about what people actually think, uh, yes, Greek is um, uh, something that exists. Yeah, I mean, I did try to sort of specify that I was, I'm talking about the classical period and even perhaps the later classical period when our source base is strongest for warfare. Um, sort of the middle of the classical period, really. Um, and, and I wouldn't want to extend that very far back because as you exa exactly as you say, firstly, we don't have the source base to confirm it. And secondly, what we do have, as far as I understand from your, um, your own talks and, and papers that you've written, is that it is actually much more diverse and much harder to draw any kind of generalizations. I was just going to throw in there what we really need to, or what uh, I personally tend to think about, is not... Um, I'm emphasizing the regionalism of the early Iron Age because I think that is at early Iron Age and archaic period, so until sort of seven, the seventh century, because I think that is something that is usually less well emphasized. But you need to, one needs to find a balance between saying it's also regional, they're nothing alike, and it's all the same, um, in that. Um, there is something different between, say, uh, mainland Greece and Crete, and uh, Aegean Greece and Cyprus or Italy, um, even though there are cultural connections. And the questions you, one of the questions we want to ask in warfare and everything else is, are the differences between Athens and somewhere in Italy or somewhere in Cyprus, more significant than the differences between Athens and Sparta or somewhere else, to pick completely random examples. Um, th there are broad strokes that are similar, and you see this in um, geometric pottery and burials with weapons. There are things that are similar across mainland Greece. Um, but there are also differences and we need to find a balance between the two. Yeah, the, um, the easiest way that you can say that there's unity is, um, or if, you, if you're looking for ethnic identity, for example, the, the big decider is language, for example, shared language is one that unifies, which is unfortunately archaeologically always a bit difficult to trace. Uh, religion, of course, is an important one. The function of religion to, to unite the people and to identify them also, which is uh, still difficult to identify in archaeological sources, but when you have uh, pictures of uh, winged horses and that sort of stuff, it, it becomes slightly easier. Um, so, yeah, th those are the two where you can say, you know, everybody who speaks Greek would, would identify broadly probably as Greek, even though there might be large differences, similar to how, uh, you know, an English speaker in, in Sussex uh, is culturally related to an English speaker in Idaho, um, uh, simply because they share a common language and a common uh, frame of reference, despite the fact that there are, are uh, let's say, cultural and, and political differences between the two. So I think that would be a useful way of looking at things. But the more interesting question then is to what extent a Greek identifies as a hoplite. Because I'm sure that, as you're aware, um, the Athenian citizenry, for instance, saw itself as a collective of hoplites, even though this was not actually true in practice. This was a matter of their ideological identification. I'm sure Owen can tell us more about that. Well, yeah, absolutely. It is um, It's kind of the masculine ideal is almost one of the best ways to describe it. Your, your aim in as an Athenian is to um, prove yourself as a hoplite on the battle line, even if you never actually go to the battle line. It's the idea that you would stand there, um, hold your position. There's very, they're very strict on these sort of things. We see in the um, in a lot of uh, in the Socratic dialogues, especially, where they talk about the importance of just standing there, holding your position. I mean, Socrates famously um, describes his own defence of his philosophy like being a hoplite in the front line. 
you would not ask me to abandon the front line. Why would you ask me to abandon my philosophy? So there is a very clear indication. Of course, as Rule kind of points out, the fallacy of this is the majority of, of Athenians, really, would uh, most likely have been in the triremes and light infantry. So it is an ideal. Um, and it's, it's sort of the classic question, how much of this ideal is an Athenian ideal, so it is a true perspective, or how much of it is the authors we have talking about it are people who served as hoplites or led hoplites as such. Um, the counter to the idea that the masculine ideal is the hoplite is, of course, the obsession in archaeology for the cavalrymen. So if you build a huge monument, there's generally a cavalry on it. If you're going to commemorate war, quite often it's a cavalryman. It's not a hoplite. So it, um, there is certainly some evidence that this um, hoplite ideal, whilst evident, is not the full picture. Well, this is something we definitely also understand from military accounts, is simply that they don't just talk about hoplites, regardless of what modern authors sometimes tell you. Like They are perfectly happy to talk about um, cavalry and light arm troops, and they generally agree that a force of <clears throat> that is composed of only one type of warrior is vulnerable because it's not sort of uh, not flexible enough it's not able to adjust itself to all possible situations um, but then the question of course becomes why is this why is there an ideology in which an entire citizen body identifies self-identifies and likes to regard itself as hoplites um, to the point where i mean this is as you said an athenian thing but it is also very clearly a spartan thing where it becomes um, a defining feature of the citizen body. You cannot be a Spartan unless you are a hoplite, to the point where they cannot form a cavalry out of their own citizen body because apparently it's just not on as a citizen to serve as a cavalry. I, I was going. I was just going to say it seems like it was a very convenient um, term to use uh, for othering um, different populations or different peoples that lived within either Athens or Sparta, just from carrying on from what Rule was saying. Yes, I mean, there's othering, but then it's always, that's always going down, right? So there's always hoplites looking down on light arm troops. But then there's the idea that cavalry service is obviously even more elite and more distinguished. And so the question then is, why isn't that the ideal that we're all looking for? Because certainly in, <clears throat> in military accounts, cavalry is regarded as the most effective troop type and the most decisive troop type by far. Um, and hoplites are terrified of them. So why doesn't an entire citizen body aspire to be cavalry? I mean, that's a serious question, especially when you're looking at a citizen body like the Spartan, which is defined by their leisure class status and clearly could afford to be all cavalry. Um, why don't they nevertheless adopt this form of warfare? Why do they persist in idealizing and, and regarding themselves as, as hoplites? Now, perhaps at this point we should, for listeners, clarify that the ancient Greeks didn't have a standing army and you were supposed to... Uh, pay for your own equipment and stuff so uh, for the most part this wasn't government issued equipment that they were handed so your personal wealth sort of determined the type of equipment you could buy and obviously cavalry would, would have been the, the upper echelons of society uh, with hoplites beneath and then rowers in, in Athens being uh, the poor basically Well and also just to clarify on that I mean it is um, from all accounts probably unique although without enough evidence, we don't know how unique. Uh, the Athenians always also have this um, system of inscription, uh, the catalogos, which only seem, I mean, this has been questioned by academics recently, but still generally accepted as only really relating to hoplites, and that hoplites could be curve, uh, called to serve by name in accordance to what deem, what um, sort of local district, if you want to call it that, uh, they're from. Um, and like I say, that seems to only really ap apply to hoplites, and then hoplites could also volunteer to join as well. Um, so it's uh, sort of going on um, the point of Josh Amber, which is the idea, you know, really the next question is why do the Athenians have to enlist hoplites and don't seem to enlist anything else? Or is that just evidence not really uh, filling out enough for us? Well, I would say so, because certainly for the early 4th century, we have um, the speeches, the court speeches in which people defend themselves by saying, I was called up into the cavalry, but I asked to be moved to the hoplites, um, where there is a, a deliberate attempt to sort of distance oneself from cavalry service, which in itself is obviously ideologically fascinating, but it shows that there is also um, a muster role for the cavalry. 
And of course, Athens was paying out quite a lot of money to have an effective cavalry, where it wasn't paying a dime for the for the hoplites. They just were supposed to turn up as they were. So there is definitely <coughs> an effort in these cities to encourage hoplite values, if the, if you if the, we can identify such a thing, and to I encourage this self identification as hoplites among the citizen body. But then to have to sort of scramble to supplement that with effective forces of other kinds, um, because they were aware the hoplites weren't sufficient by themselves. Uh, to act as a as a as a land force. Yeah. Well, and as also we've got to consider um, fourth century, especially um, the fact that in Athens, for one, the cavalry had so many other connotations that you kind of alluded to. That um, oh. and one of them is caval the cavalry were of a certain, shall we say, wealthy class that was associated with oligarchy. The numerous coups that Athens had suffered towards the end of the fifth century. Um, there's a an amazing monument, uh, very famous, the Decelaeus monument, which is of the uh, a dead cavalry monument, which goes to painful uh, ends to re to point out that he can't have been a cavalryman during the coups of the uh, the oligarchic coups. So they wanted to commemorate the fact that he was a cavalryman, but the fact that he served as he was supposed to. But on the on the uh, on the other hand really pointing out but we're not one of the bad cavalrymen that we're not supposed to like you know don't don't uh, tire him with that brush there is another very interesting aspect to that which uh, comes out in the writings of xenophon where he's talking about how um athens might improve its armed forces and one of the things that he says is that um they should not only <coughs> encourage metics so resident foreigners immigrants um to uh participate in cavalry service to add themselves to the cavalry um, but they should also hire mercenary cavalry because having some professionals in that force is going to encourage uh, the citizens and metics um, to excel and to sort of compete for, with, for skill with the mercenary. Um, at the same time, he argues that metics should be excluded from the hoplite body so that the hoplites can claim that they are fighting only as citizens together with other citizens. So there is a sort of parallel idea that you should always have as many people as possible, as many people as you can possibly get into the cavalry, but the hoplite body should be the exclusive area, the exclusive domain of citizens who need to take from this some kind of ideological um, um, identifier and, and, and strength. Well, like, where do you think that really comes? Oh, this is an open question. But where do you think that really comes from? That that kind of ideology of the um, of the hoplite and the, the phalanx formation. You know, um, we spend so much time talking about how it's not. Uh, we shouldn't connect hoplite with a sense of class, with a sense of reform, or even within the notions of democracy. But at least at the surface level, to anyone listening to this who hasn't read this in depth, what you basically got is only citizens can. Uh, join the, the cohesive group who has the sole responsibility of holding their ground. That is, that is such an important job to not leave the field and it's only trusted to citizens. Yes, although that isn't actually true in practice because they also obviously hire mercenary hoplites at some point. <laughs> oh yeah, we're talking about an ideological thing, not a, not a reality. Yeah, yeah no, but I've, I've been very Socratic about this and sort of asking questions uh, without knowing the answer myself. Um, but that is um, is the big question, I think, when it comes to this hoplite as this towering figure of, of Greek military history, is why is there such a focus on the hoplite in ideological um, self-representation when there isn't really that much of a focus on him in actual military accounts, in actual military thought, in, in tactical thinking? Um, and when there isn't so much of a sense that everybody is a hoplite, when you're actually looking at the numbers, when you know hoplites are a minority, if you have a pandemic levy, if you if you draft everybody who is eligible for military service, the majority of those people are going to be below the level that they can afford their own hoplite armor. So there is a mismatch there, and what I'm really wondering about is why is it the hoplite um, who becomes a sort of symbol of the Greek man, the the armed Greek? I think uh, there's an element here in this discussion that in <clears throat> For me, focusing on the 8th, 7th centuries, um, you want to dispel this idea that this um, ideology around the hoplite originates in this period and then persists simply because the evidence is not actually there to say that. 
it is a projection back from ideas about the classical period. Um, we haven't really got into what happens in the 6th and early 5th centuries to change this idea in the archaic period where you have like, a man and his followers um, forming up uh, groups within I'm trying to avoid using words like army because it feels anachronistic, but I probably shouldn't. But um, as Yosho mentioned, Salmon's article about this uh, groups forming behind a leader, as we see in the Iliad, and as we would usually, yeah, war bands, um, that we would... There, there are some references in Herodotus also about, like, there's this one battle where this uh, Argive warlord, let's say, shows up with a bunch of his his personal followers to take part in a in a war, which is very, very Homeric, but it's it's right there in, in Herodotus. Similar for some Athenians in the early in. period as well. Yeah, it still occurs. I think um, the latest one that we have is uh, Kimon's friends who sort of randomly turn up at the Battle of Tanagra, even though he's been exiled. And they basically say, we're here to fight for him and show how much we care about Athens and how much he is committed, even though he can't be here today. Um, <clears throat> which is a very strange story, but it's also like, it's very Homeric in that sense that this is clearly a force of hoplites who are just some, somebody's private retinue, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's also the, to go back to the lyric poet, poets, if you have uh, a look at uh, Alcaeus's poetry, the, the famous fragment in which he describes this, the store of armor and weapons that he and his drinking buddies apparently are going to use to overthrow tyranny on, on Lesbos, uh, in uh, Mytilene. Um, that, that's another example of these, these personal followings that you could, could, that you could have, and I think what Matt was trying to to get at was that this changes from the late sixth to the early fifth uh, century BC, where you see this shift away from, let's say, uh, privately organized armies, forces, however you want to say, to more state organized uh, armies, and that's probably also when to tie back into the article by by Salmon, where you see this shift from relatively smallish armies to these larger uh, armies, and it, it all ties into you know process of state formation and changes that uh, the Greek world underwent uh, right before and during the Persian Wars and that sort of stuff. Maybe Matt can also uh, well, I was uh, going to throw out there this um, part of the idea is population. So we have this idea in the Dark Age that you have um, a crisis at the end of the Mycenaean Bronze Age where um, there is a collapse and a massive population drop, um, and that the population continues to decline until around a thousand and then starts to increase again. Um, and the sort of 800 to 700 period is on a very simple model where it reaches roughly the same size as it was in the Mycenaean period, and then it continues to increase. So you have more people, you can have larger armies, you may in fact need larger armies. Um, but this is quite a uh, a simple model. The scale of population increase in the 8th century is likely to have been exaggerated. It may well be a lot more gradual than we think. Um, getting into the 6th century were a bit further out of my area of expertise. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in here while I flip to Hans's article in Men of Bronze and remind myself of <laughs> what's actually happening. Yeah, well, this is the period when, um, <clears throat> according to yeah, the latest research on this, right, they, they, the transition has always been expected to be or, or su supposed to be in the 8th century, but the latest research suggests that actually um, both archaeologically and literary uh, sources seem to, seem to confirm that the, the big change happens at the end of the 6th century, um, when suddenly the land is much more intensively used and used in different ways and marginal land starts to be put, brought into cultivation, um, which all suggests that a much more intense uh, increase in population and increase in economic activity 
um, than uh, any previous period. And it's also around that time that we first get evidence for um, sort of major state organized armies, large masses of hoplites. I mean, these are the first time that we get hoplite levies numbering in the thousands. Um, and also around the same time, the first um, iconographical depictions of true cavalry, that is to say cavalry that is meant to fight on horseback rather than uh, to go to the battlefield and, 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 and dismount to, to fight as hoplites. Um, so there are changes in warfare, changes in military organization, and changes in um, economic sort of activity that, that all seem to coincide in that period. It's the, uh, the, the late 6th century is uh, increasingly being seen as, as, a, as an important part in the history of uh, ancient Greece and in the development of, of city-states and that sort of stuff. So yeah, no, completely... Uh, yeah, this extends to, like, Athens, had, there are no buildings on the Acropolis until the middle of the 6th century, like nothing whatsoever until Pisistratus builds them. Um, similarly, places like, as far as I know, you might, might correct me on this. Yeah, uh, part of the problem with the Acropolis is uh, excavation, because um, you can't excavate underneath the Parthenon, because no one wants to remove it. Um, so, w we're pretty certain there was a Mycenaean palace on the Acropolis, but the evidence is more limited than we'd like, simply because, well, I mean, it's also a rock, so how much of the stratigraphy actually survives. Um, but yes, the certainly the monumental building on top of the Acropolis um, is 6th century and later. And other, other places as well, like the, 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 the conglomeration of Corinth into an urban centre and the use of the Laconian countryside all days to this period. Um, and the first, I mean, many people now also have moved, ever since the 1960s, when Finley wrote about this, have moved the great sort of reorganization of Spartan society along the lines that we sort of recognize as Spartan should also be dated to the middle of the 6th century rather than to the 8th or the 9th or even further back. So a lot of these changes that we used to think date sort of way to the beginning of the archaic period, we now are sort of more comfortable saying that they probably belong to the middle of the 6th, so really quite close to this, the start of what we consider the historical period where we have continuous historical narrative. Yeah, it also tallies well with, for example, if you look at Herodotus, everything before, let's say, 550 BC is always a little nebulous. And after the middle of the fifth, middle of the 6th century BC, his, his information becomes a lot more reliable and a more clear. Yeah, it's a really interesting thing about, the, um, for instance, the Spartan kings, where we have long lists of kings um, dating all the way back to, supposedly, sort of the ancestors of the two royal houses. But the first ones that we know actually anything at all about um, is the generation of the father of Leonidas and Cleomenes, so two of the major sort of figures of the sort of around 500. And, and it's only the generation before that that we get a real sense of who these people even were. Before that, they're just names. They have nothing to them, no sort of historical events connected to them in much more than a sort of anecdotal, uh, legendary fashion. Yeah, and the Greeks were great at also claiming that something was uh, an ancestral tradition dating back generations, when in fact it had been invented just a year before. <laughs> There's loads of examples in Thucydides of that sort of stuff going on. So yeah, and then if you have modern commentators taking that at face value, oh, Thucydides says this is an ancient. Well, very tradition. famously, that's the uh, um, funeral for the war dead of Athens, the Patrios Nomos, uh, the ancestral custom literal translation which most academics now usually date between somewhere in 480 and 460, and he's writing about it in 431. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's also, the, the, he, he, sometimes historians are, are funny also, when they, with Titeus about uh, conquering the Mycenaeans, so he's writing for the Spartans, and they conquered the Mycenaeans in the days of their father's fathers, I think. And then you have historians saying, oh, father's fathers, that means it must be about 60 years earlier. So then they have this fixed date, which is just also hilarious. This... Um, I did want to throw out there, uh, in denying a hoplite revolution around 700, that isn't to say that um, nothing is changing in the 8th and 7th centuries. It's just that we have no evidence for a huge tactical change, um, apart from the changes in equipment. Uh, so what we are mostly seeing in that period is a change on how um, achievement in warfare was emphasized from 
you're buried with weapons that uh, could come from anywhere and may never have been used, to you're dedicating mostly used armor and weapons often captured from the enemy in sanctuaries um, and thus it's more of a public display in your lifetime. So, As I understand it, very much an elite practice, isn't it? Yes, well that's um, this is thinking about uh, who forms our evidence. Um, most of these finds are from Olympia and uh, a few from Delphi, but again that's a place where the uh, environment is uh, less good at preserving things because it's a rocky mountain. Um, so most of this evidence is from Olympia and uh, Calipodi, a uh, sanctuary of Apollo in um, East, in Focus, um, where you get finds of weapons and armor, um, but these are not civic sanctuaries, they are um, interregional sanctuaries that you would have to travel to, which means you've got to have the means of travel, the time to travel, as well as having achieved something in warfare if you're dedicating spoils, um, and you're doing it with other two in two other people with the means of travel um, in these interregional locations. So we are looking at people who can take a couple of weeks without working the land and survive, um, who perhaps have chariots to travel in, etc. So uh, probably... Do any of these, uh, especially the earlier uh, dedications, do they come with inscriptions? The idea, that, are these individual or is it... So within the classical period you start to see more collective dedications where a group will only dedicate one thing. So actually you're now talking about a group needs to be able to produce one or two people to, to go do that. Is it is it quite clear these are individual dedications, so we are talking about an elite? I can't remember. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, let me think. I, I, I can remember from the late 6th century there are examples um, there are inscriptions. There are some sarotas with uh, with names inscribed in them, if I remember correctly. Yeah, the, the ones I can sure remember the are um, um, there's a, a battle between Argos and Corinth that doesn't seem to be mentioned in any of our sources, but there is a bunch of armor from the late sixth century at Olympia that says dedicated by, I think, the archives taken from the Corinthians. So by the late sixth century, you certainly have. Um, uh, groups, communal, yeah, collective dedications. Um, and I think it's an Alcaeus fragment, which would usually put us around 600, um, that says, the Athenians dedicated my shield um, to Athena. Uh, I can't remember the... There are 7th century inscriptions on these things from Olympia, but I cannot remember the details. You're looking at more uh, tangential evidence to show individual um, achievement, which is the times this comes up in the Iliad, it's heroes taking armor from one another, um, Hector saying he's going to dedicate the armor of the next Achaean he kills to Apollo. Um, yeah, so... What about the context of this kind of weaponry when it's found in Italy? Like, is it also very clearly an elite context? Uh, when does it start occurring? What? <clears throat> Sorry, what weaponry? Dedicated? Spoils? Uh, no, hoplite weaponry, like the kind of things that we associate with hoplites, because they obviously also occur in South Italian um, and Etruscan context. It's, it's elite. I mean, I, I think I briefly... Uh, mentioned it in our uh, previous podcast that I mean we really don't have ev burial evidence for what I would call the common man so I mean if you find an aspis mentioned as coming from a burial in Etruria it was certainly from a wealthy burial or what we consider to be a wealthy burial 
I think that's the quick answer. And I'm, I mean, there there is evidence, perhaps, that um, the Hellenic arms that were imported or the designs that were uh, created domestically, whichever you want to go with, um, were a little bit more common in like uh, public art. Throughout Etruria, you see Aspides and um, Etrusco Corinthian helmets depicted um, almost exclusively. So there's no no depiction of other types of soldiers, really, except for cavalry. But I I really do think it's all elite contacts, personally. I think um, you know. I was just going to jump in and say uh, we enter into an almost circular argument here again because so many of the contexts where we find things are elite. Um, so the sanctuaries seem to be um, more elite focused at this point in time and even the burials. So our first um, body armor is from a burial in Argos, but we, as you said in the previous podcast, um, most of the burials we find are elite burials. We don't have the burials of uh, common people, um, which means that we're arguing these are elite things, but that is partly on the basis that we just don't know enough about the common people to say that they don't also have access to this stuff. That's how it looks from our evidence, but that is partially skewed because of the skewing of our evidence towards the people who produce um, more durable material remains. So, I mean, the thing that I was <clears throat> laboriously trying to get to is the, that there seems to be a mismatch between the way that these or these particular weapons and pieces of equipment are represented in the archaeological record and the way that they are represented in the iconographic record, where, as um, Josh was just saying, every warrior has hoplite equipment. And also, if you're looking at the Kiji Vas, for instance, every warrior has hoplite equipment. Whereas when you consider the fine spot of these of these items and the way that they are um, dedicated or deposited, you get the impression that they should have been um, the privilege of a very small minority within society. So do you think there is any way to reconcile that? Is that because we just um, that we don't actually see it, but everybody would have had them, or is that because the way that they're depicted in art is just not? There's actually an interesting, perhaps parallel um, from. Etruscan evidence, again, in a Hellenic context, though, in the three helmets dedicated by Huron um, of Syracuse after the Battle of Cumae in 474, um, there are two uh, just cap helmets and one Corinthian helmet dedicated um, as spoils, and all three bear the same inscription, um, so clearly they came from the Etruscans, it was Huron, son of Denomenes, and the, and the Syracusans dedicated to Zeus, Etruscan spoils from Cumae. So you see there, even even though for the most part in the archaeological and iconographic evidence from Etruria itself, we only see the Etrusco-Corinthian or Corinthian helmets, you see that Etruscans were fighting with other types of equipment uh, in this very, very small snapshot of an actual battle that we have. And just interesting in the context of um, what we were previously talking about in terms of um, dedications, these helmets bear both the personal name Huron as well as the Syracusans. It's a, an interesting parallel in the early uh, 5th century that we have both a personal victory dedication as well as a communal dedication all in one piece or in this case in three individual pieces. As we were saying earlier about the iconography, um, on smaller vessels you can only show so much, um, but on early, um, well, proto-Corinthian, to use the uh, descriptive term we use for Corinthian pottery of this period, but early 7th century Corinthian pottery, you're already getting archers who are shown naked next to um, men in full armor. And the uh, Tateus uh, fragments again tell us that you have um, a distinction between heavily armored and light armored, or uh, I can't remember the exact word, but it means naked fighter or something. Mm. Uh, so 
there are distinctions between those who would wear armor and those who wouldn't. Um, that again, we are sort of putting a class uh, identifying these people by class, partially because of um, the availability of metal and who would be able to get this much bronze to produce something. And in the 8th century, before you start getting bronze armor and uh, shield facings and so on, um, they are tripods. And the Homeric epics tell us tripods are um, this really prestigious object. So it's a chain of evidence that we've strung together to make an argument that um, we can find holes in, but it does. Um, the evidence is there. It's whether you believe the narrative we put it into <laughs> to say that these people with bronze armor are almost certainly the upper echelons of society. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I, I imagine in your period you haven't quite got the issue which Rule and I have in ours, which is, um, there's a lovely example in one of Lysias's speeches, we're talking late 5th, early 4th century, um, in which a, an Athenian who's been called up for hoplite service sees two people who have also been called up for service uh, who can't afford to be there, so he gets all his rich mates to help chip in so that they can go and actually afford the weaponry and the armor that they are legally obliged to have and to serve with. Um, so that raises questions within our field, which is actually, do you really need to be rich enough to be a hoplite? You know, it raises those sort of questions. But I suppose in your, in your area, that's not as big an issue because you are talking about just such expensive equipment and small groups. For the archaic period, there is the, the problem that we don't really know how they uh, essentially uh, mustered these armies, whether they were able to force people to uh, take part as well. I mean, if you were called up by your, your lord and master to uh, report for duty and bring your own men, did you have to, did you just collect men who were able to buy equipment? Did you also somehow enlist the poor? Or did you force them into uh, military service in some way? We don't exactly know the mechanism behind behind it, which is, which is part of the problem. But that uh, fragment of Alcaeus you mentioned earlier does have sort of the um, armour around the walls, which um, we see in geometric pottery mm -hmm. and mentioned in the Odyssey as well, that um, wealthy men have lots of armour um, that perhaps they could distribute to friends. Yeah, it's a good um, point, because in the Odyssey also, uh, Odysseus gives the armor to his slaves, of course. Yeah. No, no, but it's it's a good point. Yeah, no, in the um, uh, Alcaeus, the, the description is, it's a poem that he undoubtedly would have would have read out or, or sung uh, during the symposium with all of, his, all of his drinking buddies who would have been uh, more or less the same social class. So the question is... Would they also, just to, to inflate their numbers, have given armor to uh, to other people that were dependent on them? For example, retainers or slaves or uh, people tilling their lands or whatever. And that's something that we don't really know, I think. But like what Matt says, the, the Odyssey uh, example is, is perhaps, you know, if the situation was dire enough, you would also tell your slave, put on this Corinthian helmet and shield and <laughs> join me outside, uh, that sort of stuff. <laughs> well, I suppose that's that's the issue in that example because originally I thought, oh, that that sort of settles the argument of, um, you know, aren't they just, you know, they could just very easily be trophies, you know, from people you've killed, you know, rather than just dedicating them all. There's other reasons why you might have arm around the house, but the fact that he sort of gives it to a slave in an emergency or also bypasses another issue, which is um, the image you you sort of give from the okay, and I know you don't mean to, it's just where my mind went. Was the idea that you you know you've got this wall and there's small armor, medium armor, large armor for all your different friends. <laughs> Check your size. Uh. Yeah, Alcaeus actually ran the TK Max of the archaic <laughs> Greek army. I knew it. I knew it. Well, it's an interesting aspect of it because you do get um, people in Athens in the fourth century trying to sort of um, display their benefaction to the city by by gifting armor to the, to the city, which is then presumably handed out. And we have no idea 
on what basis and to whom they would be handed out. Uh, you know, when, when Pazion, who is a former slave, but ends up being fabulously wealthy as a banker, um, he gifts 200 shields to the city, and the city presumably uses them to create 200 hoplites, presumably out of people who wouldn't otherwise be hoplites. Um, so people from the poor uh, classes who wouldn't be able to afford that kind of equipment and then would be sort of in the position where they only needed to buy the spear in order to qualify. But we don't know on what basis they were selected, on what basis this was awarded, on what basis their property was checked against their, you know, the equipment that they possessed. Um, so we, we have no idea how that actually worked. But it's definitely something that occasionally happens. And we have, like you said, you have the speech of Lysias, and we have this example to show that it occasionally happens. Didn't Lysias also operate a, a shield factory? No, you're thinking of Demosthenes. Or, no, wait, 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 wait. Oh, um, Demosthenes yeah, yeah. is a sword factory. Lysias' dad has a shield factory. His name is Kefalon. Oh, okay. Kefalon. There's an interesting parallel in um, the Athenian way of arming its citizens, or them arming themselves, I should say. And, um, Dionysius I in uh, Syracuse. I mean, obviously, in the preparations for what I would describe as his first war against the Carthaginians, although I think Cavan and others call it his second, because technically he fought at the Battle of Gela, or led the Battle of Gela. Um, you know, he commissions, what, 140,000 swords or daggers, um, and then this this massive arsenal um, to supplement it, uh, which you don't really see in Athens that I, that I know of. You don't see the state-sponsored manufacturing of an armory that you actually hear about again under um, his his son, fateful son Dionysius II. You hear about this massive armory once again, and presumably it actually was started by probably Gelon in 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 my eyes earlier in the or in the fifth century. Yeah, because you do get some rumor of, of armor being distributed to the men even in the cities, right? I think it's probably a feature of, of tyrants and other sole rulers. I mean, Polycrates also hired the, this small army of, of Cretan archers to uh, supplement his own forces. So. Yeah, but you do get um, so late in the, in the classical science. period, sort of at the end of the 4th century, of course, Athens institutes this, this training system, the Ephibia, which they make mandatory. And at the end of that system, you get from the state um, a shield and spear. Uh, and this is sort of an expansion of a previous program which they already had where they would give um, hoplite armor to war orphans. Like if anybody had lost both their parents in the war, which presumably happened, although it's, it's not clear how often, um, you would be awarded at state expense hoplite equipment. So it, it did occasionally happen, but it was never on a structural scale. And it's not until sort of the late 4th century that you have anything like this. And it's not until the middle of the 4th century that there is, as far as I know, any attestation of an Athenian arsenal because there just isn't anything like that and that one's only known because they started to stockpile um, catapult bolts there yeah, with the war orphans I was all, I, it always struck me as, as you know, I don't know sort of sad because you know you, you, both your parents died in the war here's some armor so you can fight and die in the next one <laughs> I don't know <laughs> no it's so you can avenge them so you can take your revenge on your enemies. It's grim, but it adds to this idea that the citizen is a hoplite, and that's what what really fascinates me. Because you know they could have given them you know a, a clutch of javelins if they wanted to do sort of put him away on the cheap, um, or you know any kind of other equipment that they might have thought of. Um, but instead, in order to award them sort of the, you've suffered enough, we will make you into a hoplite. So yeah, presumably to avenge them, to do your duty as a citizen, to take part with your other citizens despite your your uh, difficult situation um, and, and so they, they create a hoplite and that's that's how they sort of seem to treat how how they keep thinking of their citizens despite the actual situation because obviously the, the state has to sort of commit to a significant outlay in order to provide these people with um, hoplite equipment <coughs> so I mean that's that's the question that we still haven't answered I suppose and I don't know if it is answerable but it's the question of like why do the classical Greeks in contrast to the archaic Greeks, where hoplite equipment is clearly supposed to be something of the elite, something that the elite, at best, will dispense um, uh, among the poor followers that they have, among their retinue, um, but mostly is, is the privilege and, and the, the sole prerogative of the elite. Um, why is it that in the classical period we can say that this is something that the citizenry likes to believe and likes to tell other people that I can generally share? 
the, well, the main difference, I think we've already sort of touched on this, of course, is that the, the, the social political changes from, let's say, the 6th century to the 5th century BC, when you have these, these sort of more personal forms of organization making way for larger scale, let's say, state-organized um, stuff, I think that's that's an important aspect of it. But you're probably looking for something more detailed, rule. Well, no, I mean that's that's fundamentally, I think, is is where the where the answer must be is that it's not um, necessarily that this is something that everybody can be. It's clearly like the majority of the population either is too rich to be a hoplite or too poor to be a hoplite. Um, but it does become something that is represents a large enough section of the population that those who are wealthier than that and could theoretically serve as cavalry wants to be regarded as one of the sort of the the group that isn't sort of extravagantly wealthy and therefore sort of might tone themselves down to hoplite position whereas everybody who is very poor might start to aspire to hoplite position and so that hoplite weaponry as a way of serving in the militia then becomes something ideologically perhaps comparable to the way that we regard the middle class where everybody thinks of themselves as middle class even when they are actually really wealthy or actually quite poor and can only aspire to that kind of status um, so it's something that doesn't actually represent perhaps even the majority of the population, but nevertheless becomes ideologically incredibly important to that society's self-definition. Yeah, I think maybe it also ties into differences between archaic and, and the classical period as far as the definition of hoplite is concerned, whereas in the archaic period, you know, these heavily armed spearmen usually also wore loads of body armour. Uh, even towards the the end of the sixth century, you see they actually increase their body armor, perhaps because they're, it's sort of a reaction against the the social political changes that we've alluded to. So they wear a metal cuirass or a linen linen corslet. They have the the greaves, uh, a big bronze helmet, bronze covered shield. Uh, some of them ride into battle on horses. I mean, the difference between uh, you know the, the the cavalry and the hoplites that you see in the classical period that. They sort of mix in the archaic period where you have these, these what well, we refer to them as hoplites, then uh, on horses riding to the battle and battlefield, getting off fighting and then getting back on their horses where, where their squires take care of them. And in the classical period, you see this move where the armor gets lighter and the hoplite is not so much defined by all the armor he wears, but mostly by the fact that he has a shield and a spear. And you see simpler helmets or even caps. Uh, greaves go away also in the iconographic evidence. Uh, people fight in tunics rather than in armor, or if they do wear armor, they wear these linen corslets that are lighter and perhaps cheaper than bronze uh, armor, as a matter of opinion. But you see this, this change and also this, this segregation between the cavalry, which are strictly aristocratic, and the hoplites, which seem to incorporate a large a portion of society in the classical period so I think that that's all related to each other yeah what's what's always um interested me is uh especially at the moment where you know we're struggling with all these this contrast especially between these two sort of time periods and we're sort of seeing a continuum of Greek ideas but obviously this change in status change in um, political dynamics and all that that we've been discussing is a lot of the classical Athenian sources are interested are interestingly as interested. So there is um, there's the famous debate in Euripides Heracles about Heracles himself. Uh, he's not present on stage, but there is the debate as to whether or not um, uh, Heracles can be considered a hero because he is an archer, and then Lycus. The, basically, if you want to call him the villain of the piece, is 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 um, sort of articulating what we consider the Athenian norm, <coughs> which is that only the hoplite can be considered a hero in battle. Heracles is not a hoplite; he cannot be considered in the same vein. Um, and this comes up a few times. There does seem to be the sort, you know, the idea that you would challenge the heroism of who, the man who is arguably the greatest hero of the Greeks because he has a bow. I don't think Euripides is here trying to over, you know, uh, is, is articulating something that everyone agrees with. I think, I think this is supposed to be kind of startling and make people think about, actually, no, he, he's, he's got a point. You know, if he's an archer, we don't consider archers like that. We, we only consider hoplites like that. Um, you do get that challenge. You also see it a bit in, oh, I forget the Aristophanes play, but there is a, a moment where um, a speaker is talking about people who have basically earned their 
place by the blisters on their hands. And the idea, you know, is you know, blisters of your hand holding spear or oar. So it's the idea of the rowers uh, can be considered equal. And one of the useful things about something like drama is, although this is always highly contentious, at least opens up the possibility that the authors are trying to talk to more than just the specific elite we hear most about. So there is at least the possibility or the likelihood that um, someone like Aristophanes is talking to rowers as much as he is hoplites. He is talking to people who have experienced um, pulling the oar as opposed to um, stabbing with a doru, should we say? The doru being the spear. Oh, doru being the spear, thank you, Ru, yeah. <laughs> we do get a bit involved, I suppose, I'm sure we're all guilty of it. <laughs> And this almost wraps up the second episode of the Ancient World Magazine podcast. Uh, please stay tuned after I'm done talking uh, for a little bit extra, a kind of dessert, if you will. I hope you've enjoyed this particular episode. My thanks once again to Matt, Josh, Raw, and Owen for taking part. I hope you've enjoyed it. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, etc., etc. And of course, read up on articles on ancientworldmagazine.com. See you next time. The uh, hoplon question, the shield as the hoplon. Diodorus says it, but it's rubbish. Just to sort of put that out there, the shield is not called a hoplon, and the hoplite does not take his name from the shield. Owen did the shield. Hope to point out that the hoplite was named after the hoplon, so he did say yes. that. We didn't, didn't specifically yeah, that. Yeah, but we didn't, we didn't tackle that. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's not something to um, tackle in detail. We just need to say, no, the hoplite does not take his name from the shield. Um, he takes it from his see the article by uh, White uh, uh, Owen said. Yeah, and I think we can put, yeah. we can attach a further reading list to this uh, podcast that is... There's um, nothing sexier than a further reading list. There's nothing sexier than a further reading list should be the tagline to this podcast. <laughs>